So hello all, uh, welcome to the W3C call for um, 17th June. And the topic today is going to be possible changes to the RPDE uh, specification. Um, the motive for this is pretty clear. Uh, it's that the harvester model that the RPDE um, pattern facilitates uh, is pretty easy on data publishers. It's fairly simple, which is nice for data consumers, but it does kind of rely upon uh, swallowing all of the data in one big chunk, uh, which can take a, a fair bit of time and often means that data consumers end up with a lot of data that they might not necessarily find relevant or interesting for their purposes. Uh, so there's a few proposals I wanted to go over just for streamlining RPDE a bit. Um, Oh, hello, Charlie. Uh, so hi, Charlie. Uh, thanks for joining us. I was just saying the topic for the call, generally speaking, is um, improvements to RPDE to make things a little bit easier on data consumers. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here so we can take a look at the presentation. Um, Hello. Sorry, I'm a bit, uh, sorry, I'm a bit late. No worries, no worries. Um, <laughs> for once, I managed to start recording. Um, for once, I managed to start recording uh, before everybody joined the call. So uh, we're starting on time for once. Um, so, as I said, uh, RPD. The problem is. Um, that it's fairly slow in the sense that you have to get all of the data before you start working uh, with it at all. Um, and then a particular annoyance simply on my part, but I suspect for data consumers as a whole, is actually that it's very hard to gauge progress. Um, so it takes a long time and you also don't have any sense of how long you've got remaining. So depending on the feed you're harvesting, uh, it could be that you're gonna be done harvesting in five minutes. It could take a matter of days in, in some cases of the larger feeds. Um, it's often uh, the case that you end up with a lot of less than relevant data. It could be data in the past. Um, there's no requirement uh, to delete obsolete or uh, irrelevant data anymore. Um, so it can be the case you end up with a lot of stuff way in the past. Um, it's not possible to query RPDE selectively for, say, only a particular geographical location, particular activity type, or whatever. Um, so we're just going to go over a couple of proposals for streamlining things a bit. Um, the first is a proposal that I made just yesterday, in fact, and I see that Nick has already commented on it, um, <coughs> which is simply to include a little bit of pagination information in the response um, to RPDE requests, just so you've got a sense of the total size of the feed. Um, so I'll just highlight one new data attribute proposed for the response, which is just the total number of items. So in this scenario, the client would be responsible for keeping track of how many items they'd already processed, um, what their progress was like, but at least they'd have a sense of where the, the end position was. Um, Nick commented on this uh, pretty recently, um, pointing out, first of all, that this doubles the query load in the sense that you have to make an additional query on the publishing side to support this, uh, some kind of count query indicating uh, precisely what the number of remaining items would be. And then secondly, this ends up invalidating caching, of course, because if that number changes, then the cache uh, needs to be refreshed. Um, so the efficiencies of caching with RPD would be lost under that uh, scenario. Um, the refinement proposed uh, yesterday by Nick uh, was to put this in the data set specification. So when you looked at a data set site in the JSON, there would be um, an indication of the total number of items per feed. Um, I guess before continuing on with this discussion, I guess uh, I was wondering whether 
uh, Luke, Tom, or Charlie had any further thoughts on the proposal as it stands? Uh, nothing from me, although it's probably bordering on my technical ability. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say, this is a, yeah, a little bit over my head um, from a technical standpoint, but right. it seems to make sense logically. Um, um, yeah, sorry, I was going to say, uh, I don't really have anything to add. Uh, definitely uh, the points that Nick has raised about um, optimization, because um, it, it would change the sort of performance and nature of the, of the query. Mm -hmm. quite a lot, especially edge, uh, relating to edge caching. Right, okay. Um, I guess the difficulty with the data set proposal is it's not really envisaged that the data set site as it stands right now has to actually read the RPDE feeds. Um, so it seems like the technical mechanism for populating the total items property is a bit unclear to me. Oh, I can help with that. So the, the, the libraries that we currently have for the data set site generation um, are all, it's all dynamic. So okay. you, you give it some properties. I, I, I guess it's designed dynamically primarily for the use case of the kind of uh, white label solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, where you've got like a Gladstone where you've got lots of different types of customers and they've all got their own data set sites. And so because it's all dynamically rendered right now, if your data set site query, as well as querying the database for the organization name and everything else it's querying for, also query for the total number of records, which may be cached, um, then that would that would do that. And um, for example, in Gladstone right now, the data set site is rendered from the database and is um, cached, I think it's 15 minutes it's cached for, um, both on the, um, on the, the server is, is caching it in memory and then it's cached using the um, using a CDN if there's a CDN in front of it. Okay. But with, uh, but with a 15, I suppose that's the key thing. It's only cached for 15 minutes, whereas some of the pages are cached for hours or days. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Um, so then the only time that that becomes a problem is if you've got a feed that takes a long time to consume the number of total items actually could change significantly over the consumption time. So you get that, you get that sort of inaccuracy if you're caching. I guess, I guess if on the client side, you could just keep pinging the data set site for the total items property. Um, kind of weird, but yeah, okay, doable. Um, better, than, better than ruining caching, I suppose, for the, for the feed itself. Um, Okay, um, then that seems like a fairly uh, simple solution. Um, as, long as, as long as the pages are generated dynamically and the client can keep requesting that JSON object and total items is updated on a reasonably frequent basis, then, um, okay, great. Some things are easy. Um, okay, I think we can just move on from that point then. Um, to the <laughs> to the relief of Charlie and Tom, it sounds like. Um, I was going to say, my, Tim, my only question, because I, I don't like to not understand things, although I probably will regret asking, is uh, what what's the impact? Um, which is the nice gen general pointless question. But if I'm if we Playways has no intention and doesn't take any uh, direct feeds from any booking systems, so we we'll only we only intend to ever really use the um, I'm in feed or our own. What does that concept have on, on impact in that? Is it more of an I'm in, I'm in peace with the, the booking system provider? Okay, we're one of those as well. But I'm just trying to understand what, it's, what, what, yeah, what the impact is. Yeah, so I, most of that would be hidden from me because I'm in is doing that harvesting work. If I understand the flow right, mm -hmm. um, I suppose if you're consuming... Yeah, sorry, because uh, Luke and Nick, um, I'm in offers an API integration, right? So. RPDE is not something that um, Charlie would have to worry about on his end. Uh, no. Okay, right. Okay, so yeah, impact impact on you, uh, zero in that case. Awesome, that's what I like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so it might, um, it might help, I mean, a little bit in the sense of, of planning out how long 
it'll take to consume a feed and that kind of thing. But uh, if you're if you're sitting behind that, um, it won't affect you at all. Fine. Good answer, Tim. I like it. Yep. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Well, the other benefit is it doesn't break anything that's existing because we already need to go around and update everyone's data set sites when the new spec comes out anyway. So this isn't going to add any additional um, lobbying effort or um, otherwise to um, to changing our PDE if that was the thing that we need. It would, it, yeah, it doesn't doesn't add any more to than that's already there. Yeah, that's great. And the fact there's no no need for uh, yeah breaking changes or similar to make an enhancement to improve is good. Development yeah. cost saved. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks, chaps. Okay. Uh, and I suppose also in terms of workflow, it's easy in that the data set site specification still has to be written. So it's easy enough to add that line item in there. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll migrate that issue over to the data set site specification repo then. Um, I don't know if I described the next proposal. Um, in the best possible way. I don't think this one needs very much discussion either, to be honest, because looking at the thread, there already seems to be a lot of consensus around this. Um, but the proposal is essentially, and uh, Nick, please jump in if I'm mischaracterizing this, to allow harvesting to start not from the absolute beginning of the feed, but essentially from now. Uh, meaning that you can start harvesting only opportunities that exist in the present or future rather than having to pick up all of the ones that have existed in the past. Is that a fair description, Nick? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. Um, so then the only point of debate was really about which approach to use. Um, the difficulty is a little bit technical in that to create that capacity to start harvesting from the moment that the query is launched, actually, because of the way the specification is written, that would drop the first item in the feed. Um, so the question is, how do we make sure that we get all of the events that we need to? Um, the first approach changes the query slightly, which makes a sort of a fairly deep change to the specification and or rather the guidance surrounding the specification. Um, there's a few more slightly um, hackier kind of approaches um, it, to allow that retrieval to be made without altering the query quite so radically. Um, but generally speaking, it seems like looking at the comments, everyone who could be uh, bothered to comment um, seems to be keen about the first approach there. So even though it's um, a fairly, well, moderately significant change to the query itself, um, approach one seems like it's getting all of the votes right now. Um, and I'm having a hard time seeing what the disadvantage is of approach one. Um, it seems like anything else is kind of slightly unsatisfactory. Um, Nick, was your was your worry that implementing systems would have to make a sort of deep change for this to work? Yeah, it was just because it makes the the actual um, makes the query a little bit more complicated. But I mean, as, as I suppose it's as it's written as simply as as it can be there with the um, with the query uh, with that extra line where in the where clause. Um, but I suppose it's just, just because that's the it, that query is the bit that's that's most often done wrong, uh, and because we haven't got um, because of the way that we test our PDE, which is just checking the invariance, it's going to be quite difficult to also test that this is done right um, yeah. without kind of the test harness, for example, of the booking spec being enhanced to add a well. I suppose it already it already does do this. Um, so, so using the testing of the booking spec, you could do something like add an opportunity and check that it comes through, um, and and then check that so the check that this all works. But because of the the kind of weird edge case about that first item, mm -hmm. to actually check this properly, you'd have to really um, you'd have to know the first item in the database, right, to be able to or or artificially insert the oldest item in a test suite. 
and then check it came through. So it's just a real gnarly, like, you know, to actually validate this works, given that the biggest problem is with the query. Um, but I think all the, all of these involve um, some form of query changing, uh, I think. So yeah, I suppose it's just a kind of, yeah, the lesser of the evils. Yeah, and it's sort of it's sort of inherent in the in the in the goal, isn't it? That testing becomes a bit more difficult. Um, yeah, b because it adds a variant, and it sort of can't help but add a variant. Um, okay, so yes, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll just add a note on there that testing is an issue, and we need to we need to make sure we've got that covered in 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 future. Um, but I think this should probably just go through as is because the the benefit of it is significant. Um, you know, particularly in the larger feeds, I can imagine this. You know, taking processing time down from from hours down to minutes. Yes, for sure. Yeah, so that seems like a really really valuable addition. Um, and then, sorry, this is part, oh, what was uh, that? Sorry, yeah, no, no, carry on. I just remembered the reason that we didn't do the other stuff is because of the string constraint. Uh, that's right. So it has to work for every every use case because there is a simpler option available if you've got an ID, which is not a string, which is one of, which is what some of the other approaches we're talking to. But it's I think it's fair to say a lot of people use strings as IDs because they've got GUIDs involved. So yeah, yeah, um, and then there's even assumptions being made about the ordering of the of the IDs, isn't there on that one as well? So yeah, it feels like you're not out of the woods even if you do have a numerical ID. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and then the last one I think we've actually already covered in that I think one of one of the frequently voiced difficulties with RPD is that you can't query it basically. Um, that you can't say I just want everything in this particular geographical area or something like that. You have to download everything and then slice it up yourself. Um, but again, this just runs into a caching problem, doesn't it? Um, yeah, the, the, yes, that, this is exactly it. The second that you start adding um, any types of parameters outside of what you've already got in there. In fact, even the limit parameter in the, in the RPD spec that it stands um, doesn't really work for caching. Um, or at least, yeah, it, it, it creates problems. So you could, I mean, a, a good implementation could just ignore that parameter. Um, and, uh, and so that doesn't, which is what a lot of the big, the big um, high scale ones are doing. Mm -hmm. and just override it with whatever. Um, so yeah, so anything outside of just where you are in the paging, which changes the pages, um, just yeah. Yeah, radically increases the number of permutations of the data set that you're able to download and then um, undermines all the load, mm -hmm. the, um, the load management that you can do using the CDN at the moment. Right. Um... I feel like, yeah, it's tricky. I feel like we're a little bit imprisoned by our caching, um, that we need everything to be sort of as static as possible so that we can cache it. Um, well, I guess, I guess here's the thing, right? If we, wouldn't, if we wanted to go down the road of, 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 of closing these endpoints down so they weren't fully open and having API keys on them and everything, which is what? Um, I mean, because of the cache thing that we're able to have all these endpoints fully open and, and able to, you know, we've had several challenges, um, Legend, Sports Suite, I guess anyone who's looked at this at, at, for scale has kind of gone really into the detail of, you know, does this CDN strategy actually work? Does it actually protect my servers? The answer is yes, it absolutely does as it stands because of the constraints we've put on the, uh, on the, on the endpoints. Um, if you wanted to do anything else, you would, I think it's fair to say from all the feedback that we've, we've had, we would need to start adding API keys. And the challenge as soon as you start doing that is that you get into situations where people who have opened the data can start to be very selective about who they decide to make the data available to. And then you end up in that slippery slope towards a, a bit like we, we saw previously with them, um, with where Sports Suite were before they kind of um, realized the benefit of the open license and, and looked at what, what kind of, what the kind of philosophy of open active actually was, was you know, they, they, you have a form where you fill it out and then they approve it and then you get an API key, but they might not approve it if, you know, 
I mean, I'm not saying this for sports food, but the implication is they might not approve it if you're a competitive organization or if it, you know, it doesn't quite. So you might have an open license. Um, and so, and, and the ODI is, you know, the view on this has always been that, you know, if you have an open license, then actually that's fine because an aggregator, for example, can just consume that data and, and republish it in open license. And it's, if it's open, it's open. But I think practically in this sector, um, we probably want to make sure that open means open and we're not relying on aggregators and others to, you know, redistribute the data with an open license uh, and, and have kind of those additional gatekeepers on there um, just because we want to lower the barrier to entry in the market, really. And so um, the, the solution in RPD at the moment is there's inline filtering which you can use, which means that you can, um, RPD is designed so that if you want to slice the data set, you can do that arbitrarily based on the data in each data, in each payload um, of, uh, of each item. And um, you can do that in line. So you can only load into your database exactly what you need. You don't need to store everything, but unfortunately you still need to, you still do need to page through everything. But of course, if those pages are cached, then the paging should actually be fairly quick. Um, and you're, you're benefiting from that edge caching to go through and only take what you need from the data set and store it. So that that's kind of, I guess it's it's a philosophy point really as much as anything, it's the reason this constraints are there. It's interesting because yeah, I mean there are there are open APIs, um, but yeah, depending on on keys. Um, but yes, if the reality of the sector doesn't support that, it doesn't support that. I guess. But it also increases the amount of work required for everyone, right? Because everyone needs to manage, have, have an API management solution in place where they can manage API key distribution, uh, manage signups. And a lot of these smaller organizations like our parks, you know, this is a, they do the, the tech work. And then as we've seen, they've only touched it, you know, they touched it four years ago and now they've touched it again to update it. Um, but there's not really a, a high amount of resource being dedicated to to managing access to these things. Mm -hmm. So what's what's the fear exactly? Is the fear DDoS attacks or? Uh, well, less DDoS, just more just a high volume of consumers mm -hmm. asking different questions. Yeah, I, it, like just, just on the um the like performance angle. Um, I recently just had a look at all of the, uh, I think it was, it was all the session series data, but um, all of the session series data that I'm in harvests. And um, I think all of it gzipped was something like uh, 50 megabytes or something, which can be downloaded yeah. you know, on an average UK connection in a second. So I think if, so, so um, at which point, you know, if everything is, is edge cached and everything is included, then, um, uh, something can should in theory be able to you know if it's, if it's downloading as, as frequently as, as it can do be able to get the entire data set very quickly and then they can decide um uh at that point whether to keep that bit of data or just drop it on the floor based on their own filtering if they want but um so if if, if we were to add query parameters that do geography based filtering then um that reduces the amount of data but as far as I can tell, there's not there's not a great amount of data, even when there are a lot of locations. Um, but you don't get any of the benefit from the edge caching, so the, the data gets there much more slowly. I'm curious that it only comes to 50 megabytes. You said that's just session series. Yeah, right. it was a uh, it's yeah G the gzipped to uh, with a high yeah, amount. Okay, okay, right. Um. Yes, because the data, the, the challenge with this whole infrastructure has never been the data volume. It's always been the real time nature of it. The value of having uh, the up to date information about when a session is and how many spaces are left and having that coming live from source. So if you wanted to get a static version of, you know, what, what, what the sector looked like in a certain point in time, you could probably get all the systems to pull that in a CSV and then shove it somewhere. And then, but, but that's, yeah, that doesn't that doesn't achieve the objective of creating that real time view of what sessions are available tomorrow, and so that's I guess why this this is geared towards making the data like I guess that's why RPDE is about more the real time element of it and less the kind of downloading from the beginning because the value you you don't get the value from this by one download right the download in itself 
is great for the first time someone's got it. So I, I totally see some of the you know challenges around the first time someone harvests the feed. You've got lots of stuff to download if you need to resync that feed. But the ongoing value you're getting from that as a, as a business, as a consumer, or whatever, is not downloading the whole thing again. It's just the fact that you get to with a minimal amount of work, um, a minimal amount of, um, of of bandwidth, you can get those changes. And there's actually not very much going on there in terms of when you're just calling for changes. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my personal experience is focused more on, ah, well, hold on, I want to capture other detail. Yeah, this, I guess this is the problem with the filtering solution is supposing you change your database schema, um, you then have to re-harvest, meaning you do it all from the top again. Yeah. Um, meaning you then you know sync the time again so it's it's not very agile i suppose it's good if you've already got an established business methodology and logic that says okay we can just keep on pulling in deltas basically well, well actually i would argue it's um more agile because you don't need to the problem we've got with distributed querying is that every single type of query needs to be implemented on every single data provider mm -hmm. and so if you want to add a postcode search and that doesn't quite do do it because of whatever reason to go around every single provider and get them to uplift their feeds to support that particular query parameter. And it, as the data evolves, and so then does the query parameters. And, and then, of course, you've got the challenge of versioning those parameters. So if you change the definition of one, you've got to go through and make sure you've got a, some homogenous. You've got, to, you've got to figure out a mechanism so that you get the same kind of data back from everyone. So I think the, well, it could, it could, it could be viewed that the current situation is, as it stands with the, with the harvesting is actually the most agile because as a data consumer, you can really radically change the kind of filtering you're doing. You can, you can merge, merge the data however you want, although you've got to wait for the harvest to happen. The, that actually historically in the sector has not been the biggest problem. The biggest problem is, as we've seen, waiting for systems to implement stuff. So if, this is, if what this is doing is giving you basically a fire hose of all the data and you can choose how you cut and, and, and do what you want with it, depending on your use case, um, then that's optimizing for the thing that, um, you know, it, it makes, it, it, it might have a bit of slowness in, in terms of downloading it, um, but you're literally saving years compared to trying to get that data from whatever APIs are in the, in the you know, or, or a lack of APIs are in the systems as it stands. Right, so by removing the complexity on the publishing side, you end up with more data generally is, is what you're saying there. Um, yeah, abso absolutely. And, look, and also um, you, you, you're more agile because you've, because you've removed the complexity, you've got access to all the data um, and the, the, the approach you, you can use, which you can apply to every data set is, you know, filtering based on the standard, whatever parameters you're interested in. And you can decide to apply new and interesting filtering to that. You know, you don't have to wait for everyone to implement the more than uh, date field for the end date, right? Like you'd, you'd have to go through and wait for every data provider to do that and the time that would take and the cost for all of those implementations. You, you just add that single line of code to your harvesting tool, press go, go have a cup of coffee, come back and then see if it's worked. Um, which is yeah, great. I mean, my experience is that you uh, go and have a cup of coffee then you go to bed, <laughs> then you wake up, check on how it's doing, uh, go to bed again. I mean, it's, you know, the, as, the, as the volume of data increases um, and as the kind of experimentation you want to do gets more bold, I think the time overhead becomes more and more um, oppressive and certainly debugging is no fun, right? Um, Absolutely, and and I guess that was the previous um the previous issue right around um, making sure that we can we can limit the amount of data in the feed to that useful set. Yeah, which significantly reduces that. Yeah, you're right because if you're if you're pulling from the beginning of time from GLL, you're looking at literally millions of records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the, yeah, but I think as you say, the 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 now proposal does get around most of that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the. It shouldn't, it, we shouldn't underestimate the, the burden that gets put on data consumers um, as a result of removing the burden from data publishers, that's all. Um, but uh, yeah, if, yeah, I feel like the, the caching is invaluable for a publisher, but it creates uh, headaches for, uh, for a consumer. Um, but uh, within, within the domain of the possible, um, yeah, this does do a nice job of 
um, making sure that there's actually some data, there's some data published that the that consumers can use. Um, okay, so um, I think this might just be a question that we revisit based on the um, ability to start harvesting from now rather than from the beginning of time, because as you say, GLL has got millions of records, but of course, uh, the, most of those are historical. So we become much more agile if we can, if we can throw away uh, obsolete data. Um, I guess that becomes a question of how do we, what's the process for getting implementing systems to make that change to their queries? I guess the first one, as you pointed out, Nick, is testing. Um, we need to have some way of verifying that systems are doing this correctly. Is it simply a question of supplying the right tests and then uh, communicating that out to providers? Yeah, well, I guess, I guess the, um, the uh, what, did we, what was the name of it? Um, the retention period. So that's, that's on the um, open active docs already. And I know that we've been um, pushing that with bigger feeds to try to get those feed sizes down anyway, just as part of just general discussion um, as they're kind of moving to the next version of whatever they're doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I get, yeah, having, having testing in there would be, would be useful. Um, definitely. Um, I'm just trying to think if you can, I don't, I think because of the way that this is fairly transparent to the consumer, it's probably not easy to add to the RPDE tests in the validator, mm -hmm. just to harvest test. So we probably would need to do this in more of the way that the booking suite. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Insert a record, check the records come through, you know, that, that type of level, which which is definitely, yeah, definitely feasible. As I mentioned, there's already similar tests in there. So maybe it's just adding a couple tests in there. Um, I mean, you could even add it as a feature in the way that that, that framework's currently built, the feature mm -hmm. being yep. um, stateless retention period. And if someone chooses to support that feature, then it goes green. Yep. Uh, and then we just promote that feature along with the other features. Actually, I was thinking this the other day, you know, that that open active test suite is actually pretty good if you don't implement booking because it does do data set site validation. It does full um, harvesting of the data feed. I know that um, Josh in uh, Playways found some bugs in the open data feed just by using the, the, um, the test suite. So it might be that, um, and this is just an idea I had yesterday, but it, it might be worth looking at adding validation of the open data pages into the test suite, just doing that as it goes or having an option set so you can turn that on. Um, because that what that then does is means that you've got this kind of full feed download test test harness you can yeah. use. Um, and if you combine that with this feature, then you could almost imagine like a profile of, you know, you can configure that test suite with a profile of features, which is just open data, actually nothing to do with booking. Um, so it just covers the open data. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's nice. So that, that suggests, I think, um, if the proposal is to add the total item count to the data set site um, and to implement the movable first page, um, that suggests that we prioritize um, getting a specification up for the data set site um, published and testing against that as part of getting these two improvements to RPDE actually practical and verifiable. Um, and then the third point about parameterization becomes much less, um, much less critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's kind of a nice way forward. I think um, looking at the test suite is more than just booking and uh, extending it to cover open data is a, is a really nice way of tying that package up. Um, so I think that's it, that's it for RPDE. Um, we're well ahead of time, I think mostly because uh, the issues had largely been resolved in GitHub uh, before we started discussing them. Um, uh, is there any other business anybody would like to raise on the call?
I suppose there's only um, one just uh, about the um, data set site uh, specification is obviously um, that's that's something that is being presently I mean the whatever iteration of that that's there in in, in the github issues is being used in the test suite um, because there has to be something in there yeah. um, and so I guess it's just a, a comment that there's obviously a um, present implementation is is happening against that by necessity yeah. With uh, the current implementers, I know Playways is uh, is already underway, and others. So um, I guess there there might be um, in parallel to completing that test suite, um, which I know we're all is a is, a, is an urgent thing uh, to to be done. It might also be that there's a an urgency around finishing that data set site spec so that w w things are done. <laughs> well, it, you know the definition of done means really done, not like. Done, and we'll have to revisit it when that other spec comes out in like a few months' time. Just, that's just a thought. Yeah, no, that's a good point, and I think it's a bit worrying that the dataset site specification has been kind of it's existed as a default for a long time now, um, right? As as bits of JSON floating around in the ecosystem, which isn't tremendously helpful. Um, yeah, like I I even noticed um, the other day. I just I thought it was a bug actually, but it turned out to be a well a feature or a, um, a result of that. Um, the um, the case of content URL or something I can't remember what the um, is it content URL or access URL whatever the URL is that's being used for the booking spec stuff which has come from DCAT actually has a different case of URL than the schema.org stuff. Oh no! <laughs> All right, because DCAT uses access URL or whatever it is. Is I, I you know I check, actually checked DCAT's um, original spec and yeah they have URL capitalized whereas nothing in schema.org has URL capitalized. And so even, I mean, that sounds super basic, doesn't it? But obviously that's a conformance thing we need to mm -hmm. uh, make. And that's something that now exists by default, as you say, because this is kind of all evolved and not really being cross-checked. And so um, just just kind of, uh, yeah, even even that stuff just needs to be, um, well, I guess we just need to make a call if we're going to use DCAP vocabulary. And I know that, um, Tim, you had a, a, a chat with Dan, didn't you, from schema.org? about web api and his his kind of or their ambition for that and whether that was going to fit in yeah that was um that was a long time ago um the schema door our conversation has gone off in a completely different tangent for reasons nothing to do with open active um but yeah there has to be some kind of decision about how we reconcile dcat schema.org and and us um well, so Tim, I was going to ask you this question um, separately, but maybe, it, I mean, given it's relevant to the group, is it worth updating us all on the schema.org chat and the um, and the, the web API kind of Dan conversation? I know this is like, <laughs> it's been on my backlog for like six months to ask that. But. I mean, there's not, there's not actually that much to say. Um, essentially, the web API, well, the last time I looked, which was a couple of months ago now, the, the web API conversation within schema.org had spiraled off into big questions of scoping, um, which were kind of outside of our remit, basically. Um, so there's not a lot to update specifically on us because it wasn't it wasn't like it was not a dialogue of we've got this proposal to make, um, and then schema.org thought that there were some problems with it. It was more other voices outside schema.org felt like web API should be describing a much different range of services. Um, and that conversation was swirling the last time I looked at it. So I don't have anything too valuable to add beyond that it's not the right time to be making very concrete proposals with regard to web API. Because there's- right. so just to be clear, is, it, is that um, Dan's comments in addition to what was in schema.org's um, uh, con the content on GitHub? Or is that, that just, I mean, basically is all of what we're saying on GitHub or is there stuff that's context from Dan that's not on GitHub? No, there's everything, everything's on GitHub. Yeah, you can follow that on the schema.org mailing list on GitHub, yeah. Okay, oh great. And and, then, and so what, and with regard to the, you said this uh, separate kind of conversation that's gone off in a different direction to do with openactive and schema.org. Oh no, sorry, not, not to do with openactive and schema.org. Um, I mean, with web API and schema.org. Right. Got it. Yeah, sorry. So I guess the place to look for updates on that, which is some place that I should look for updates, is the schema.org mailing list and um, repos. Um, it's not particularly our own internal GitHub repo comments. 
those are all those are all fine in our little world but how much our little world coincides with schema.org's conceptualization of web api that's a different question yeah completely makes sense so i guess to, for clarity then um is there anything from the, your conversation with dan that is not in the github issue that's worth there sharing? is nothing yeah out of band yeah everything's everything's documented and out there yeah okay okay great no, I wish I wish I could say we had this great conversation. Here's how it's going to go. Um, yeah, I'm lining it all up, but that, <laughs> that's not the case. Um, well, I guess this is it. It's because it, it's because the, uh, the 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 thread on schema does. Yeah, like you say, I think we we did comment a, a few further up a few times, but it doesn't look like any of the original contributors to that. Um, so you, I don't know if you you saw that there's a a separate W3C community group like Open Active, like this one that's. Um, for web api mm -hmm. and so though that and, and a couple of guys on there seem to have on the github repo um put together an initial spec and that's part of the thread and then it looks like that's there and then there's a bunch of other thoughts but no one's really kind of bringing it together it's just kind of it's it's like opening the diamond up rather than closing it down so i guess i guess i was hoping that dan might have had or someone might have had like a imperative to close it because it seems like someone needs to go in and be a ringleader there. Otherwise this whole, yeah, everyone's just kind of. Crying. I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think the problem is even just the name, I think indicates this, that the scope actually has to be pretty wide. Um, the number of questions that have to be answered is quite high. I don't think open active particularly, we can drive the conversation there if we want to, but I think it's going to be a long conversation. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm just checking. It hasn't. There's been no movement. No, 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 there's, nothing, there's nothing. There's nothing outside that be, that very amorphous thread going on. Yeah, there's, and there's no movement on it since February. Would yeah, I haven't. I haven't looked back in a long time. Um, okay. I mean, I could. I could. Uh, raise the issue again on that thread and say, here's the direction we want it to go in. But I, I suspect that that will be, begin, that will initiate a very long process. Uh, so is what we're saying for this then that the best way to take this forward is to kind of just do our own, our own thing, define our own types. Kind of yeah. Given, on. given what was earlier said about the priority of getting this done, I okay. think we define first and worry about schema.org. Um, alignment. Yeah, we do worry about it, but it's not the first priority. Oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Well, I guess if we, if we set it up in such a way that um, future conformance to schema would be a, uh, um, it's all, so I guess what we're, what this means is because obviously part of the point of the data set sites is that Google can index them and others can index them, um, that there will be a necessary step at some point to, con to align with what they're doing. And I guess it sounds like what we're saying is, is we set this up such that everyone who's harvesting these feeds is going to need to support two versions of something at some point in time. So as long as we like, you know, the version that we've put out there now and the version that schema.org eventually decides is the thing. And so I guess if we set it up such that it's not like a, yeah, like we've, we've done what we can to, to, to use schema terms so that it minimizes the difference, I guess, and then just like some kind of obvious switch in the type, maybe like open active web API, that means that someone who's consuming this can write like a simple switch statement and then do everything, or, you know, whatever needs to be done. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think if we get a solid kind of, if we, if we create a solid enough standard and people are using it, I think we're in a stronger position talking to schema.org to say, actually, here's a syntax that, that should be supported or should hold weight with you. Um, but we are simply in a position where we have to decide first, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, any, any further points anyone wish to raise? Nothing from me. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, apologies if some of this conversation seemed a little uh, technically involved. Um, but uh, I think there were at least some, some clear actions going forward and um, uh, I think quite actionable and reasonably urgent. So we'll be pushing those forward in the very near future. And thank you all for joining. I'll give you back uh, 10 minutes of your day. <laughs>